Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Tuesday, January 25th. Uh, oh, my video is not on. Hold on. Okay, I think that's better. Although I'm not sure it's much better. <laughs> it's the same Pierce person. Okay, so today's uh, January 25th lecture. We're going to kind of diverge a little bit today, but not too much of a diversion. So we're gonna talk about organic molecules that are not part of our world here on earth. We're gonna talk about molecules out in space. Now, why should we be concerned about compounds that are uh, in some distant galaxy or on Mars or what, you know, what, 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 what would that do for us? Well, it does a lot for us. First off, we always want to know where we are in the world, right? We want to know how did we get here? How did, how did life form here on Earth? Well, we can get clues about how, how we came to be by studying, uh, oh, let me enable my transcription here. All right, so we can actually um, discover a lot about how life began here on Earth by discovering things that occurred outside of Earth, things that happen in distant planets or distant galaxies. And we'll go through some of those early molecules that, um, that were part of the Earth. Now, I'll, I'll caveat this right away. Nobody knows definitively how life began on Earth. When you think about the molecules that existed uh, at the time of the birth of our planet, they were very, very modest. Uh, you know, we may have had oxygen and some nitrogen and some cyanide gas and a few other compounds, but, you know, we had none of the building blocks for life. And we'll talk about today, especially one particular building block, amino acids. Now, let me go ahead and I'm going to pull up a, a picture. This is a very important experiment uh, Yuri and Miller did years ago. So I'm going to find my screen here. Hold on a sec, share screen, here we go. And let me go to, uh, where is my, hold on just a moment, gotta find it. Here it is. Okay, now I need to share my screen. That's not the right one. I need to share this screen. I need to make it bigger so I can see it. All right, let me click on this picture real quick here. All right. I hope, I hope all of you can see this diagram. It's a relatively simple picture, um, but it's a very important one for us to at least theorize. How did some very early molecules um, develop here on earth? So let me focus your attention here on the left. I'm circling this globe. This, this ball here. And in this globe, in this piece of glassware, uh, the, your, the Yuri and Miller added water vapor, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen. These would have been the gases that, that 
probably made up our atmosphere in the very early part of the Earth. Now, they, they inserted two electrodes. They inserted um, this electrode, positive and negative, along this filament. And basically, they sent a spark through this gas. Now, that created new molecules that were larger than these four compounds. Now, these molecules that were heavier condensed. This is a, a water jacketed cooler here, by the way. So the liquid that came through the cooler was condensed and went down into this tube. This liquid then was allowed to hit here and circulate. So basically, what they did was they set up this loop. So water vapor then would come up. They'd open up this valve to the methane and the ammonia. And this was follow in here. Now they did this for many, many iterations. So the water, methane, ammonia, spark it, condense back again. So this liquid would come in, distill it. That's what this is, a distillation. The heat source under this water caused the liquid to turn into a gas. Then this gas flowed up, came around under the pressure, because you know, anytime you, you turn a liquid into a gas, you create a pressure. And this pressure of this, this, this gas would come up and, and then over and over again. Now, eventually they shut everything down and they analyzed the liquid in this tube here. And to their surprise, they found the precursors to what could be amino acids, not amino acids. They didn't generate amino acids from here, but they found precursors that could form amino acids in this experiment. So let me, let me get out of that. Stop my share here. Um, let me see if I can actually find the actual experiment here. Sometimes they give me, no, they're not going to tell me. They're going to make me want to pay for it. All right, stop the share. So getting back to our experiment then, Yuri and Miller were able to prove that from some very, very modest, simple gases, they were able to create new molecules that could, under the right circumstances, eventually lead to amino acids. Now, I don't know how much biology you've had. Some of you probably have had more biology than I have and know much more about protein synthesis than I do. But the precursor to proteins are amino acids. Now, in order to string these amino acids together to make the polymer, that's the whole thing here, a polymer of amino acids are proteins. Now we have 20 amino acids, 10 of our essential, 10 we, we actually um, have to consume in foods. So these amino acids then um, have to be made in a particular way. Now that creates another whole class of molecules that we need to have, not just amino acids, that we need to have for life. These are the nucleic acids. Very early on, it was discovered that the precursors to RNA, not DNA, RNA, could be formed from some fairly basic molecules given the right source of energy. Now, in Yuri and Miller's experiment, the energy provided to the gases was a spark, an electrical spark. And if you think back to the early Earth, there were a lot of thunderstorms and lightning. So the possibility of high energy electricity from thunderstorms was pretty high. So you can imagine the early earth being just this ball of, oh, wow, that's a cool bird. This ball of gases that were being hammered by these electrical storms of the early earth. You could, you could, you could make the, you know, it's a leap. I'm not saying that they, this is definitive, but it is, it's a leap that says it could, it could happen. All right. Now there's another whole 
class of thought that says that early life on this earth was seeded from other areas and that meteorites and meteors from other distant galaxies may have planted the seed of life here on earth. And there's valid, now there's a lot of biologists that, that would poo poo that idea, but there's a lot of validity to that thought as well. And some people believe that we were seeded by some distant galaxies. And, and we'll talk about that later. All right, so getting back to these early molecules, I'm going to, again, share my screen with you. Uh, right here. And let me see if I can find the experiment that they did. All right, so let me share my screen again. I'm gonna to try to make this big. Okay, so let me see if I can, let me see, so wait, I, I can get this to be larger. It's not going bigger. Mm. Let me see if I can go view. Zoom plus, plus, there we go, plus, plus. Okay. Now, after Yuri and, and Miller's experiments, a lot of other scientists continued this and, and, and made it even better. And so they were able to show like after Miller died, he, he died a while ago, by the way, both, both Miller and Yuri have been dead a long time. Some of these experiments were actually shown that they could actually synthesize amino acids. I just hovered over that. We're gonna, we're gonna draw this in a minute. That is what we call an amino acid, an amine and a carboxylic acid that are part of the same molecule. This part, is the amine part, R NH2. And I, I'll, bring, I'll bring up my notepad in a second. This part over here is the carboxylic acid part, R C double bond O, OH. And they're, they're part of the same molecule. Now, what I want to show you is this carbon right in the middle. R, like any R that we've talked about, is variable. Maybe this is a methyl group. Maybe it is an isopropyl group. Maybe it's a, a benzene ring with a CH2 group. That would be phenylalanine. Um, but that Miller and Urey experiment proved that the early precursors could have been made from some very, very simple precursors. Remember what those precursors were? Ammonia, water, methane, and let's see, what else was there in there? Methane and ammonia and hydrogen, hydrogen gas, sorry, hydrogen gas. Now that's the one that, that we, we need to talk about a little bit, hydrogen gas. Um, this is what we call a reducing atmosphere. Hydrogen gas is one of those things that, that is what we call a reducing uh, diatomic gas. So the, here's sort of the uh, uh, guidelines to how this experiment worked. So we can get atomic oxygen, we can make carbon monoxide, methane can form formaldehyde, carbon monoxide, CO, plus ammonia, can make hydrogen cyanide. We're gonna talk about this one quite a bit here in a moment. Now, here's the key thing. You get down to this step where we make cyanide gas in a reducing atmosphere. Now we have the ability to make the amine part of our molecule, okay? So, uh, and by the way, uh, this is, I'm gonna post this to our Moodle page. 
actually, I think it's already there, uh, but you'll be able to see this or just go to Wikipedia and just put in Miller and Yuri, M-I-L-L-E-R, and then Yuri, U-R-E-Y, the Miller-Yuri experiment. Very, very important. Now, were those the only molecules of the early earth? No, we have hydrogen sulfide, we've got sulfur dioxide. There were many, many different gases. But the key thing were those four compounds where they uh, talked about. So that was the, the theory of life on earth being generated from some very early precursor gases on earth. Now, here's the second theory of how life could have happened here on earth. Extraterrestrial sources. So what we know about the Miller-Urey experiment is that these kind of gases are present in other parts of our solar system. Now, they might also have storms or they may also have ultraviolet light from a star nearby. They may have light from distant suns. It was discovered that there was a meteorite that fell in Australia back in, most of you were not even born back in 1969, but this meteorite was found to contain several different amino acids. Wow, wow. So perhaps life was indeed seeded from some distant galaxy. Now, in addition to that meteorite, comics, comets and other uh, bodies are thought to contain lots of these complex carbons. They, they call these thiones. It, it's sort of a bro broad term, thiones, a broad term about these complex carbon uh, materials, okay? And the Earth, remember, we're, we're bombarded by comets, and the early Earth was bombarded massively in the early part of the the, the gestation of our earth. So this is called panspermia, panspermia. Uh, panspermia is the hypothesis that life exists in our universe. Well, we're getting into some heavy stuff now. Um, I can't tell you which theory is right, which theory is wrong. Um, panspermia, might be a fringe theory, uh, but there's a lot of mainstream scientists who, who think that this could possibly be, be true. And obviously, if you start finding amino acids on meteorites that come from someplace else, certainly that says maybe life does exist beyond Earth. We haven't found it yet. I think we will. I think the odds are too high that this is not going to be uh, something that we'll eventually discover. Definitely not in my lifetime, but maybe in yours. I don't know. I I'm on the far end of my yardstick. You're just starting out. I'm going to reset this down. Minus, minus. So um, let, let, let me stop this share for a second and bring up today's lecture, because this is what I want to talk about. We're going to, again, talk about um, functional groups. Now, I just mentioned two functional groups just there in my little primer. I mentioned uh, amino amines and I mentioned carboxylic acids. We're going to have a whole lot more to say about both of those functional groups all throughout the class. But we need to continue to develop our list of functional groups. What I'd like you to do is to get a, maybe towards the back end of your notebook. I would like you to have a page that says organic functional groups, okay? Just list them. So we've already talked about alcohols last class, right? So you know what an alcohol is. We talked about carboxylic acid esters. You know what those are. We, we're, we talked about carboxylic acids and amines in this class. Today, we're gonna talk about nitriles as well as those other groups. So let me share my screen with you again. Let me get to today's lecture and get my notepad out. 
make this a little bit bigger so I can see it. All right. So let's continue our functional groups. You already know what alcohols are. Uh, we've talked about um, um, alkenes and alkynes. Some people refer to those as functional groups, but, but really, for me, that's really not a functional group. A functional group is typically something that has a heteroatom, one or more heteroatoms. And again, what is a heteroatom? Something that's not carbon, right? Nitrogen is not carbon. Oxygen is not carbon. Sulfur is not carbon. Uh, phosphorus is not carbon. All right. So let us now uh, talk about nitriles for a moment. Let's, let's, let's talk about A to start with. R, single bond to a carbon, triple bond to a nitrogen. This is what determines a nitrile. And again, R is variable. Maybe R is a methyl group. That's one particular nitrile. That particular nitrile will be called methyl nitrile, or the common name is called acetonitrile. Another R group might be a propyl group, CH3, CH2, CH2. Maybe that's what R is. So basically, just like before, R just means something variable. So that's the broad class known as the nitriles. Okay, now we'll come back to these other groups here in a moment. We will talk about amines, we'll talk about carboxylic acids, and we'll talk about these compounds, amino acids, that Miller and Urey were able to make, or at least their, their subsequent partners were able to make in that, in that experiment with the sparking of the globe. Okay. Nitriles. Now, perhaps some of you uh, know about the, the simplest nitrile, hydrogen cyanide. This isn't, I guess you would call it an organic compound, although it's really not organic, but uh, it is a carbon compound. And that R group there is a hydrogen. Now, potassium cyanide, this is a salt, by the way. It's a white crystalline salt comprised of an anion and a cation. The anion part is the cyanide anion. C triple bond N with the negative charge on that carbon atom. The cation part, remember anions and cations? Is a simple potassium ion. So cyanide is a polyatomic anion. Polyatomic anion. Now, not two poly, right? It's really only two atoms, but if it's more than one, you call it poly. So this is basically a salt. Now, if you take this salt and you put it into water that contains a little bit of HCl in it, so it's basically acid water, all of a sudden bubbles start to happen. What are these bubbles? The bubbles are hydrogen cyanide gas, okay? And this is what is formed when people um, and again, please with the chats, be careful because I'm going to get into some politically charged uh, discussion at the moment. Um, I don't know what your opinions are of the death sentence. Please do not chat about it. Uh, I, I, this is a, a topic that can be very polarizing and, and can be very hurtful. So when a prisoner is brought into uh, the chamber, into the room uh, for their final moments, into the gas chamber, 
They're, they are placed in a seat uh, strapped down to a chair. And there is a, a tube that is connected underneath the chair. And there are six tablets that are, that are sitting behind the prisoner. These six tablets are released into the acid water that is sitting in the chair below the prisoner. Only one of these um tablets is actually potassium cyanide they do this for a reason so six people in the gallery watching the execution will then push a button these six tablets will then fall down into the tube and then eventually work their way down to the beaker of acid water underneath the prisoner the room will fill up with hydrogen cyanide gas. In a not very uh, short time, uh, the prisoner will expire and, and, and will move on. And so hydrogen cyanide is a deadly, deadly gas. But hydrogen cyanide is also found in the atmospheres of many planets. Hydrogen cyanide was found in the early atmosphere of the Earth. Hydrogen cyanide is found in many distant galaxies. Now, how would we know that? How could you possibly know that hydrogen cyanide gas exists in this, in this crown cloud nebula? or in this star dust? Can you send a rocket out there and retrieve it and bring it back? You cannot. It's too far away. You can't go to the, to the, to the nebula with a rocket ship, sample the gas and bring it back. So what do we do? How do we know? Well, what we do is we look at the light. This is a technique widely used in astrochemistry known as spectroscopy. Spectroscopy gives us the ability to look at the light that's coming from some distant galaxy or star or anything else and determine what are the molecules making up that distant galaxy. How do we know there's helium? and there's hydrogen, and there's hydrogen cyanide. We look at the light and we send it through a spectrophotometer. We dissect that light and we determine the composition of the gases from that distant galaxy. That's how we're able to do it. Now, let's go down to the middle for a second. Let's come down here, this molecule, methyl cyanide. Notice that when it's a simple one carbon, remember one carbon is methane, methane, A-N-E, right? But when you have a simple carbon that's bound to another carbon, we have to change the engine ending from A-N-E to Y-L. Look at out here. We don't call this methane cyanide. We call it methyl cyanide, YL. YL is the ending for what we call a substituent when the group is attached to something else. Now, there's a common name for this group too. Uh, methyl cyanide is also known as acetonitrile. It's a liquid where hydrogen cyanide is a gas, methyl cyanide is a liquid. Uh, you wouldn't want to breathe it, uh, but you know it's nowhere near as toxic, obviously, as hydrogen cyanide. Um, it is widely used as a solvent. I used to use uh, acetonitrile as part of a chromatography solvent system 
a, a lot in my laboratory. Now, one thing that you should know is what makes up a nitrile. Like I said, it's C, triple bond N, attached to some variable R group. Now, if you take acetonitrile under reducing conditions, what is this way out here? Look, look at over here. You see this R in the brackets above the reaction arrow? That stands for reduction. If there was an oxygen in the bracket, that would stand for oxidation. But in this case, we're gonna reduce acetonitrile. So there are a lot of different ways, a lot of different reducing agents. One system is the hydrogen gas that we talked about earlier. Oh, wow. So now we have hydrogen gas, we have C triple bond N, and we can create a means one half of the amino acids that we need to make life. Now, another thing that nitriles can undergo is a reaction known as hydrolysis, adding water to the acetonitrile. And if you do this, this can generate another functional group, the carboxylic acids. Well, we have the two parts now. And we just learned two very, very important organic reactions, reduction and hydrolysis. What other reactions do we know? Well, we know about an oxidation reaction known as combustion. Remember, we learned that earlier when we were combusting uh, natural gas, when we were combusting carbon. That combustion reaction is one particular oxidation reaction, but there are many, 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 many more. So just like I told you to have a page in your notebook that summarizes functional groups, I would like you to take another page in your notebook that summarizes organic reactions. So we know uh, reduction reactions, hydrolysis reactions, and combustion reactions, oxidation reactions. There would be many versions of reductions, many versions of hydrolysis. And just like combustion is one version of an oxidation, we're gonna learn a lot of different kinds of oxidations. You already know a lot of these anyway. So when you take a, a, a pool and you add chlorine into the pool to destroy a lot of the organic compounds in the pool, that's an oxidation process. When you have a hot tub and you have ozone, O3, ozone, remember ozone, O3? Ozone can also be an oxidant that can destroy organic molecules and make the pool healthy to, 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 to get a nice soak. So we'll learn a lot of different oxidants. We'll learn a lot of different reductants. And again, you don't have to memorize any of these things. Don't please, don't just ad nauseum, memorize a list of stuff. I will never ask you list all the reducing agents that we've learned in this class. I would like to sh you to show me a catalytic uh, hydrogenation of a nitrile to make an amine. That's again, I will, if you were taking full-blown organic chemistry, 221, 223, uh, then yes, I would, I, would, I would demand that you know how to do that. But that's a much more uh, rigorous course this is not a course designed uh, for you to get some massive in-depth knowledge. This is, again, we're looking at the forest. We're not looking at the trees and the moss and the, and the bacteria. 
We just want to know big, broad themes. I want you to know that organic molecules can be made outside of our Earth. They can be made in distant galaxies. And we can know this through spectroscopy. Now, I just mentioned ozone a moment ago. Uh, when I was reading your essays from the homework, uh, by the way, good job with the homework. I, 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 I think you all are doing a good job on the homeworks. I'll be posting another homework on Thursday. It will be due Sunday evening. So be prepared for homework number two coming up uh, in the not too distant future. Okay, now, but when I was reading some of your essays, there were several students, more than several, quite a few, who mentioned that CO2 uh, can deplete the ozone layer. This is not true. Uh, carbon dioxide, and, and which is a greenhouse gas, and methane, methane is another greenhouse gas. Neither of those two greenhouse gases is an ozone depleter, the ozone layer depleter. Um, things that deplete the ozone are what we call uh, halo carbons, uh, co compounds that have uh, organohalogens. And the ones that we're gonna discuss, not, not today, uh, next class, we're going we're to discuss uh, uh, organohalogens, um, things like uh, dichlorodifluoromethane. So you have a carbon atom with two, and, and instead of four hydrogens, you have two chlorines and two fluorines on that carbon atom. That's, that's one type of a freon. It was widely used as a refrigerant several years ago. Some, some countries still use it illegally. It's been banned. Uh, it, it was widely used as a blowing agent for foams. It was widely used as a propellant to get gas out of a cylinder. So say you have deodorant or hairspray and you need to push that stuff out. It was used in that, that purpose as well. None of that happens anymore. And that is because when dichloro, difluoro, and, it, and all of its cousins, all of these halogenated cousins get up into the atmosphere, those compounds do in fact destroy the ozone layer. And there was a giant hole forming at the poles, giant big holes in the ozone layer that allowed ultraviolet light to penetrate and get down to the earth. Now, ultraviolet light, as we'll learn later on, is what we call ionizing radiation. It can damage DNA. And certain people, especially Europeans, fair-skinned people, would get melanomas at very, very high rates when they would get sunburned. And therefore, it was banned. And now we no longer have it. And here is one of the great, great, great success stories in environmental chemistry. After the ban on uh, hydrocarbon, fluorohydrocarbons and chlorohydrocarbons was made, the ozone hole began to shrink massively. And the, the, the uh, levels of melanoma, especially down in Australia, because they're more towards the pole, dropped dramatically. So here's where environmental policy can really uh, affect human existence. Let's hope good minds, uh, when it comes to carbon dioxide and methane, uh, see the history of freon bands and, and see how we can make the, the earth better. All right, All right. I, I digress. Again, uh, please be, be generous with your chats with each other. A lot of different opinions, one way or the other, uh, but we're all in this together. Uh, Republicans, Democrats, independents, we're all going to have strong opinions about this, um, but we all have to be kind to one another as well. All right. So let me now, oh, let me, let me talk about this for a second here too, by the way. 
Um, I want to draw for you on our ChemSketch program an amino acid. What is an amino acid? Let's come back here. Amino acids have two parts, an amine part and a carboxylic acid part. That's why it's called an amino acid. Now, what I want to show you, this is kind of important. Let me go ahead and I'll even, uh, let me see if I can get a different color here. Let's get green. Do you see the carbon of the amino acid that I just labeled with that green dot? If, if that carbon is something that's not a hydrogen atom, then that carbon is what we call chiral, chiral. Chiral means handedness. So you know you have a left hand and a right hand, don't you? And you know that your left hand is not your right hand. Well, guess what? Certain carbons, certain carbons are also chiral. And if they contain four bonds, and those four bonds are different things. So let's look at that carbon atom. So we have, first off, NH2. That's one thing, number one. Then, get red again, we have the carboxylic acid. That's group number two. Then, we have this hydrogen atom. That's group number three. And lastly, again, R cannot be hydrogen. Remember, the definition of chiral is there has to be four different things. The last group, I'll, I'll choose green. Oh, it didn't work. Hmm. Let me go back. See if I can get green again. Is this R group? That's number four. Four different objects around that carbon atom. And if that is the case, that carbon atom can exist in two different handedness. Do you remember last class we talked about constitutional isomers? where you had the same chemical formula, but a different connectivity. This is a second kind of isomerization. Let me get black. This kind of isomerization is known as stereo isomers. You, you probably are too young to remember this, but when I was a boy, uh, a stereo meant you had two channels. You had a left channel and a right channel. And if you had headphones, uh, you could listen to two different channels. So a stereo means a left and a right. Stereo isomerism means I have a left and a right-handed form of the molecule. The connectivities are all the same. It's just how they are oriented in space. So now we have stereoisomerism, and we also have constitutional. You need to know those two words. Eventually, we'll get to configurational isomerism. There'll be a third kind of isomer that we'll deal with later on, not, not today. All right. So this has vast implications. We have a chiral carbon atom. Now, let me pull up ChemSketch for you and let's draw an amino acid together in ChemSketch. And let's see how we do that. I need to stop the share.
share screen. Let me get to Ken Sketch and make this just a little bit bigger so I can see it. Okay. So uh, you're not seeing that, are you? Can you see Ken Sketch? Anybody give me a hand? No. No. No, you can't. Okay, let me try that again. Stop share. Share screen. Can you see it now? No. Yeah, dang. We can see it. Oh, good. Thank you. Okay. Let me get rid of this this group here real quick. So let's start from fresh. So let me um, delete that. All right. So I want to draw for you a very simple amino acid. Now, by the way, there is one amino acid in which that R group is a hydrogen atom. It's called glycine. It's the simplest of amino acids. Since glycine has two hydrogens on that carbon, it cannot be chiral. But I'm going to draw for you a chiral amino acid right now. So I'm going to choose carbon. Let's go ahead and put up a carbon here. And then I'll just keep carbon. And I'm going to just draw a simple bond out here to another carbon. And then go to the left and draw another carbon. Now, on this carbon, I'm going to draw another bond. Oh, nope, I didn't want to do that. Let me erase that. Edit, undo change bond. On this middle carbon, I'm going to draw a bond down. And then I'm going to draw a bond up. So here's that central chiral carbon atom right there. Now, right now, this is in chiral because I have four different groups that are all the same. So that cannot be chiral right there. But what if I change this group out here to be a carboxylic acid? Now, how am I going to do that? Well, let's just draw another bond out here. Another bond. Oh, okay, yeah, we can do that. No, I'm gonna I'm gonna edit, undo that bond change. So you see how that would make a new bond, but if I slide this over to where it lists the atom, now I can draw another bond up this way. Okay. Now that's not a carboxylic acid yet, but it's gonna be soon. So I'm gonna slide over here to the left and choose oxygen. I'm gonna turn this into an oxygen atom, this methyl, this carbon into an oxygen. See how that did that? Now it automatically assumed that that was an OH. But watch what happens if I make this into a double bond. You see how if I slide this over, it shows up as another bond? Watch what happens when I click on that. Double bond O. Oh, okay, that's part of a carboxylic acid. Now let's choose oxygen again and put that out here. Okay, I have my carboxylic acid. Now, Let's come up here and change this atom to a hydrogen. Hydrogen. Now, let's change this group out here to be an amine. So I got to have a nitrogen out here. You just drew your first amino acid. Okay. This is one of the, this is not the simplest. Glycine is the simplest. But here the R group is a methyl group. Now, that is not very pretty. I don't like that. So what I want to do here is I want to come up to tools and I want to clean this up, clean structure. Look at what happened there. Oh, now it made all the angles nice and pretty. Now, another thing I can do, I can go tools and I can uh, uh, do things like remove explicit hydrogens or add explicit hydrogens. If I add explicit hydrogens, that put, puts in all the hydrogens. If I remove explicit hydrogens, it takes them away. But here I want to show all the hydrogens. Add explicit hydrogens. So there they all are. And again, this is not terribly uh, informative because look at that picture. Doesn't it look like everything is flat and in the plane of the, of the paper? 
We know that that's not true. Molecules are three-dimensional. This carbon atom here is tetrahedral. This carbon is tetrahedral. This nitrogen is tetrahedral. This carbon is flat. That oxygen is tetrahedral. So I am going to come up here and I am going to uh, use my tools and I am going to, nope, not there. I am going to come up here and let me get my right. I haven't memorized all these. I don't use this particular program very often, so I, I haven't seen these very much. Ah, here it is. Okay. Way over here in your palette, this structure here where it says 3D optimization. I'm going to click 3D optimization. Oh, it put a methyl, uh, an ammonia group here. I don't want that. I want to get rid of that. Delete. Okay, now I'm going to come up way up here next to this little reaction here, and I'm going to check 3D optimization. Watch what happens to my drawing. Yes, I want to remove the hydrogens. That makes the math much easier for the computer. There it is. This is now in a three-dimensional form. I know it doesn't look like it to you. Let me rotate this around. Can you kind of get the sense of the three-dimensionality of that molecule? You kind of have to flip it around to kind of see the, the I'm getting dizzy. I got to stop that. Okay, I get motion sick pretty easy. I want to go ahead and edit this, um, and, and I'm going to undo edit undo the three dimension. Okay, so there it is. I am going to un, uh, tools and I'm gonna get rid of all those hydrogens, explosive hydrogens. Then I'm gonna come up here and I'm going to view, I'm gonna take this molecule that I show you here and I am going to put this into the three dimensional program of the Chem 3D so that we can look at that amino acid in several different ways. And again, what I show you here is just one particular isomer. Let me, let me rotate this around some. Uh, I want to go ahead and rotate this. So this chiral center here is only one particular uh, amino acid. If I had swapped this methyl group and that nitrogen on that carbon atom, I would be making the opposite hand of this particular amino acid. I would be changing the right-hand form to the left-handed form just by swapping any two groups on that carbon atom. By the way, this is given a name. It's called the alpha carbon. So what we're talking about today are alpha amino acids, the amino acids that are designed to make protein in you and me. That's what we're good at. We're really good machines at taking simple amino acids and stitching them together to make proteins. All right, now, how do I, how do I get to my Chem 3D program? Again, here's this PubChem words up here slide over to the left and hit 3D viewer. Takes a second. Okay. Now I have to actually share my, stop that share and share my 3D viewer with you. Uh, otherwise it's not going to work. So let me share my screen. Nope, that didn't work. Let me go back. Share screen again. Sorry, I'll get this down. It takes a while. Um, share screen. 3D viewer. Okay, now I got it. I'm getting a little bit faster, but still not great. All right. Here is that amino acid that I just drew for you. 
typically, almost always, red means oxygen. Blue means nitrogen. The lighter Carolina blue are carbons. So this is the methyl group out here. This is the alpha carbon. It's the one. How do I know? What is the alpha carbon? It's the one between the carboxylic acid and the, and the amine group. So tools. I'm going to do 3D optimization real quick just to make sure it's optimized. And, it, and, and there it is right there. So here's C, double bond O, OH. Here's the carboxylic acid. Here is the C, single bond to the nitrogen, H. Now, where's the other H? Should be two H's there. I'll show it to you in a minute. You can't see it. It's behind this H. Here's the, here's the H on the alpha carbon. And this group that I'm circling over here to the left is the methyl group. All right. Now, I'm going to do 3D rotate and rotate this. Again, you're going to be able to do it much better than I can because you've got a better computer. Go a little bit more. A little bit more. Okay, there we go. Can you see the hydrogen back there now? So there's the second hydrogen on the amine part of the amino acid. So if in your project, when you make your project, you want to, to create a nice amino acid, maybe that's one, one thing you'll choose for your project. And I'll, we'll talk about that next week, projects. But now you know how to draw amino acids. Um, again, if you, if you wish to, you can automate this. If I come up here, oh, not 3D optimization. Don't choose this rotate. Choose this one out here, auto rotate. Now, before I leave this, do you remember what this kind of model is called? This is called a ball and stick model. Let's, let's view it as wireframe. Takes a minute, there it is. So here's wireframe. So now I can see the C double bond O, the OH. And the nice thing about this, 3D rotate, it's a little bit faster because the computer doesn't have to work as hard uh, in rotating uh, these little uh, stick figures. I could also view this as uh, dots, space filling dots. There it is. Come up here, view it as space fill. There you go. A lot of different ways to view it. And as I said before, I, I kind of like balls and sticks. I don't know why. I think it's just something I've gotten used to over the years. All right. So here is uh, the amino acid with the methyl group. It's the second simplest amino acid. Uh, we have 20 essential amino acids. Some of the amino acids we can, we can make ourselves. Some amino acids we have to consume in our diet. Uh, now, uh, again, uh, please be kind with your chats. I, I am not vegan. Um, I do eat meat. My sister and brother are both vegans. Uh, and so when they come over to my house for holidays, um, a lot of times my wife and I have to be careful about what kind of uh, foods we serve because you know, there are a lot of amino acids that they have to get from food sources that are not meat. So beans and, and tofu and other kinds of protein sources that will allow them to get the full complement, to get all 20 amino acids so that they stay healthy. And, and by the way, they've both been doing this for over 30 years and, and they're, both, they're both healthier than I am. So a, a vegan diet is actually a, a quite a healthy diet. Um, so, but I leave that up to you, that, that that's for your discretion. All right, now, I, I, Oh, I'm getting late on time. Okay, I, I want to stop this now because I want to pull up a, a Kahoot for you to try. So let me stop my share real quick. And while I'm setting the Kahoot up, if you would open up your uh, Kahoot program, uh, wherever you have your Kahoot, and if you would enter not your nickname, but your number, 
So some numbers and the final things are PB. That actually is very helpful. So while you're doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull up Kahoot real quick. Takes me a second. Kahoot's not the fastest program in the world. All right, let me share my screen with you so that you can see my Kahoot. Too many windows up. Share screen. Kahoot. this up a little bit so I can see it. All right, this particular Kahoot is not very long. There's just three questions and it, it's basically about talking about the molecules that are not part of our earth, that are part of the galaxy. So um, I, will, I will give you a few more minutes to, to get your program up and going. Now I'm going to hit start, but don't worry about it. You know, I, I'll give everybody a chance to log in. We're going to play this as a classic mode. Again, you're not competing against each other. The program just sets it up that way. We're, we're, not, we're not seeing who gets the fastest. What I much prefer you do is just get it right, get it accurate. So don't rush to try to beat somebody else. Okay. Now in your Kahoot program, uh, again, you're gonna use your number, not your nickname. You need to enter the number 479-9589. 479-9589. And I'll give everybody a minute or two to log in. And again, even after the game starts, if you're a little late getting in, uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to, to hop in. Um, it won't allow you to answer previous questions, but at least it'll give, give you some input into future questions. Okay, it looks like most people are in. So I'm gonna go ahead and start the Kahoot. And you can, um, you'll, you'll you, I, I, hopefully this is fairly straightforward. And again, don't panic if you don't get it all correct. Uh, it, it's fine. Okay, so let me go ahead and start my Kahoot. Okay, which of these molecules is found? beyond Earth? Ammonia, cyanide, methane, or maybe all three of them. It's true. 
all three of those are found in, in distant galaxies, uh, in, in samples. Methane is actually found uh, on Mars. They found shoots of methane that come off. Does that prove life existed on Mars? You know, of course not. Uh, that's just, just what it is. All right, continuing on. Uh, let's go. Second question. Which class of simple organic molecules would be an indicator for possible life beyond Earth? Alkanes, alkenes, amino acids, aromatics, life. Give you a hint, what are we made of? A lot of us, I know we're made of mostly water, but correct. Amino acids, that was the Yuri Miller experiment. They took some simple gases, they sparked it. The simple gases represented the early atmosphere of the earth, and they were able to produce amino acids from those very simple molecules. Now, were they chiral? They were not. They existed in both the left and right-handed form, half-half. That's another uh, a topic for another lecture, but that was a 50-50 distribution of the left and right stereoisomers. All right, continuing on. Okay. Last question. To determine the presence of organic compounds in remote galaxies, what do scientists use? Do they drill? Do they use chromatography? Do they use distillation? Do they use spectroscopy? How do you know a molecule like cyanide exists in a distant galaxy? Spectroscopy. Correct. Spectroscopically, we look at the light from the distant galaxy. We separate it on something called a spectrophotometer, and then we can analyze that. All right, so well done. Good Kahoot. Looks like most of you got that correct. Um, so don't, don't worry who got gold, who got silver. Olympics starts up pretty soon. Uh, I don't know if you're a big Olympics fan, but I am. All right, so that's it for today. Now we do have about uh, five or 10 minutes uh, left in our lecture. L let me close that out. <laughs> that, that noise is annoying. I, I wish there was some way I can shut it off. Um, okay, let me get my zoom back up here, make it big. All right, so we have, like I said, we have five or 10 minutes. If you got any questions you wanna ask me, uh, that's fine. If you want to wait till Wednesday, or I mean, not Wednesday, but Thursday office hours, that's fine too. Uh, feel free, just unmute yourself and speak up. Um, I still don't understand the chiral thing. Is that only when we're looking at them like three? Like, what does it mean by like left and right handed? So, left and we're going to have a lot more to say about chirality, by the way. So basically, it's an arrangement, a three-dimensional arrangement around a central object, a point in space. So if you have a model kit, or maybe I'll do it on the, uh, on the computer. Next class, I'll try to remember to do this on the computer. I'll, I'll make a simple chiral molecule, and I'll draw its opposite enantiomer. So the strict definition of chirality, a chiral center, is a non-superimposable mirror image of itself. So one example of a chiral object is your face. Now, I know we seem like we're symmetrical. Our faces are symmetrical. But if you look at the mirror, you are seeing your opposite enantioma. Same thing. If you put up your hand, to a mirror. What the object in the mirror is your opposite hand. Your, the image of your right hand in the mirror is your left hand. Isn't that true? Same thing. Hold your left hand up to the mirror. What's in the mirror? Your right hand. 
Molecules are the same way. And, you know, let's face it, your hands are all the same. Aren't, aren't, aren't your hands exactly the same thing? You have a palm, you have the back of your hand, you have, you have five fingers, and they're the same on both hands, aren't they? So what is it that makes the difference between your left hand and your right hand? You know, it, it, let's say you were cutting wood. You borrowed your dad's chainsaw and you were cutting down the tree and you accidentally uh, cut your left hand off and you went to the emergency room and, and, the, and you showed the doc your, your, your bloody stump and you told, doc, uh, I cut my hand off by mistake. You need to help me out. And she's looking at your left arm with no hand. So she goes back into the closet. And she says, you know what? We just used up all of our left hands, but I have a drum of right hands. Do you want me to sew that on? And then you look at her and you say, sure. Left hands and right, that, that's the same thing, right? They're the same thing. So she goes and gets a right hand out of the drum of right hands and she sews it where your left hand got chopped off. Think that's gonna work? Nope, just try it, it won't work. So your left hand is not your right hand, yet they're connected all the same way. So what is it? It has to do with the three-dimensional uh, configuration of your hands are, are different left and right. Again, don't, don't stress over it too much. We're gonna have a lot more to say about this uh, when we get to the topic of chirality and stereochemistry, but it's an important one, especially when we get into drug design because there are a lot of drugs, both drugs that are from nature, and we get a lot of drugs from nature. Of course we do. Morphine, where did morphine come from? It came from opium. So uh, a heroin that you get from the opium poppy can be converted to a lot of these drugs that we use to treat pain. They're called opioids, and there are synthetic opioids, but almost all of them are chiral. And so if you make the wrong-handed form of the drug, it doesn't work. Because the receptors, the brain receptors, the opioid brain receptors are just like a glove. And if that drug doesn't fit into that specific glove, let's say all the, all the receptors in your brain are right-handed gloves, and you try to jam a left-handed drug into that right hand, it won't work. So that's called the chiral drug issue. And we're going to have a lot more to say about uh, drugs, whether they be synthetic drugs or drugs that we get from nature when we, when we start talking about the alkaloids. That, that's a term we use for m medicinal drugs. Um, both drugs of abuse, obviously heroin, that's a drug of abuse, right? Morphine is a pain medication very similar to heroin. And when we, when we start putting up pictures, you'll see how similar they are. Um, but again, that's for, another, that's for another time. So we'll talk about that later when we talk about drugs. Any other questions? Nope. Okay then. Well, I wish you all a good Tuesday. I hope to see some of you in office hours on Thursday. And if you can't make it to office hours, certainly uh, in lecture on Thursday, I hope you can all make it. Uh, and if you ever do miss a lecture, they're always online. So if you have a dentist appointment, don't cancel your dentist appointment to come to my lecture. Just watch it when you get home from the dentist, if you're not drugged up. Okay. Hasta luego.